So I just want to give a little kind of a, uh, a little update on spinal cord stimulation, run over the basic uh, literature that kind of supports its use today. Um, these are my disclosures. I have, in fact, worked with, I think, pretty much all of the major neuromodulation companies. And so I am conflicted because I love this technology and love this uh, area of medicine. Um, so uh, there have been two real big trials done that have shown the effectiveness of spinal cord stimulation in general. They were both done a while ago. This is the, um, I would say, the, the, the first trial uh, done to show that spinal cord stimulation is better than medical management. This was a uh, multi-center European study um, done with uh, Dr. Kumar from Canada. Uh, he has since passed away. Um, but it was a, it was a well-done study with 100 patients that were randomized to either best medical management or placement of a spinal cord stimulator. Um, and then they followed them for two years uh, and uh, basically found, uh, looked at a number of outcome measures, found, looked at both leg pain, back pain, uh, disability, and uh, quality of life. Uh, and found that uh, leg pain at ODI and quality of life all improved at two years out with spinal cord stimulation, um, not uh, with best medical management. Um, however, back pain two years out uh, was not significantly improved at that time. Uh, it was uh, significantly improved at three months, but then two years later, it was no longer significant. So that was in 2008. Um, and uh, multi-center study. Uh, the, the only other issue that it really outlined, though, was that spinal cord stimulation had a lot of complications associated with it. There was a 31% complication rate uh, in that study. Most of it was related to hardware migration uh, or infection or loss of therapeutic effect. Uh, not you know, incredibly dangerous complications, um, but uh, costly and um, you know, costing the patients uh, in terms of time and, and pain as well. Um, another study was done in 2005. This was done by physician uh, Richard North at Hopkins, a uh, neurosurgeon, and he basically uh, took 50 patients and randomized them to either uh, repeat surgery or to spinal cord stimulation. So these were people in his practice um, that had already had surgery for the low, for the back uh, lumbar spine once and were continuing to have symptoms, either back or leg pain, had to have some leg pain. Um, and he re randomized them to either reoperating on them or to spinal cord stimulation. He, he was the only surgeon involved for both arms, but he only included people that he thought had reasonable imaging uh, to reoperate on them. So, so they had to have some uh, pathology remaining that he could identify and try to do something about, uh, but still then randomized them to either spinal cord stimulation or reoperation. He allowed them to cross over from one category to the other after six months and then followed them all out for two years. Um, and you can see the bottom here, the, um, the overwhelming response is that uh, neither category did incredibly well. If you look at the 24 patients that were randomized to spinal cord stimulation trial, we had 15 success in the end. Uh, randomized to reoperation, 26, three successes in the end. So not a great outcome. And if you look at the overall uh, data here, it's basically a 47% responder uh, rate, uh, meaning that they had a 50% improvement in their uh, pain over preoperatively compared to a 12% responder rate with reoperation. Uh, for the people that crossed over from spinal cord stimulation to reoperation, none of them got better. For the people that crossed over, had, had the reoperation, didn't work, then crossed over to spinal cord stimulation, 43% uh, of those people improved. So almost the same number as if you had never had the reoperation. Um, so in the end, that was felt to be uh, a, you know, um, showing that spinal cord stimulation is better than reoperation in his cohort of patients. He also looked at costs related to each success and found that um, for the spinal cord stimulation, uh, it cost about almost $50,000 per successful outcome, and about uh, for reoperation, about $105,000. Uh, per success for reoperation, um, and then if for the crossover group, uh, it was quite a bit more expensive in each category, 117,000 for the success in spinal cord stimulation, and 260,000 for the reoperation, uh, but, uh, but again, did not have any successes there. 
Um, so those two studies were actually using this technology, uh, which was uh, really based on one company and uh, only using four contact electrodes. Uh, starting around 2004, a new generation of technology came out and it's just been accelerating more and more since then. So um, these are the, this is on the left, you can see a percutaneous lead uh, from that era. Here you see a surgical paddle lead from that era. Um, and now you can see the technology from all, a number of companies have come up since then, and the technology is much more advanced. We have paddle leads and percutaneous leads that have many more contacts and many more combinations, many more alternatives that were available at that time. Um, there are a couple of other unique technologies that have come out. For example, uh, Medtronic has a kind of dynamic compensation uh, aspect to their pulse generator now. It has the ability to uh, basically change between two different settings based on the position of the patient. Uh, it's been observed for a long time in spinal cord stimulation that, you know, as people lie down, their spinal cord actually sinks down a little bit, gets closer to the electrode, and can it can be much more strong because the field is much stronger as you get closer to the electrode. So this, this technology helps to compensate for that um, by having accelerometer, accelerometers within the IPG that can change the setting uh, to, to uh, help minimize that. Um, another is something called anodal intensification. Uh, this is uh, with uh, Boston Scientific. Um, basically, it, the, the way the old technology was, you have the anode and cathode all in one midline, and the field of stimulation can, the, if you want to get it deeper into the dorsal columns of the spinal cord, it really extends in a radial fashion, so it also uh, gets out into the root entry zones, and in the thoracic area, when you uh, stimulate those, it's not uh, considered to be very pleasant by the patient, so you really want to, you want to descend deep into the dorsal columns to get all of the spine, the back fibers and the leg fibers, but not get it too far out laterally. So um, one advances to use something called a tripole technique where basically you can put an anode on either side that helps to compress the field more medially and then you can use that cathode, the negative there, to stimulate stronger and get more medially and deeper without going laterally. Um, a new technology uh, with this anodal intensification allows us to actually reduce the cathodal current, which is the central current right here, uh, by shunting some of the uh, current to the pulse generator. And that way you can essentially um, increase the relative uh, anodal contribution and sort of shove it more medially. Then you can crank up the volume on the cathodal uh, current and drive it deeper and more medially without uh, getting it out into the um, root entry zones. Um, we also have a significantly greater ability to know what we're doing when we do the programming. Um, we have now kind of a what you see is what you get programming ability where we can um, say, okay, we want the stimulation to go right here where the A is, and the algorithm will pick the number of cathodes and anodes that are necessary to place the central point of stimulation right where we want it. Uh, in the past, we've had to basically manually turn on and off contacts and experiment with each patient to try to end up with, the, uh, with, with what we wanted. Um, there are also a lot of changes in terms of MRI compatibility, and this has been, I think, a very big interest of uh, patients and some referring providers. You know, everybody um, has probably seen patients that have had stimulators and can no longer have an MRI because of that. Almost all of the companies now have MRI conditional uh, stimulators. Um, so that, you know, if that's something that's incredibly important, we can definitely put in a stimulator that will allow for either head or body or extremity MRI, though in a conditional manner. And we do have to be fairly specific about what type of electrodes we use and which companies we use to, fit, to tailor uh, to the needs of the patient. But, but it's no longer a uh, complete stumbling block. Um, I wanted to present another uh, study that has come out uh, last year. Uh, this is with a, a new company on the block named uh, Nevro. They've come up with a high frequency stimulation paradigm, uh, which is uh, much higher frequency than the traditional, uh, uh, usually around 100 hertz uh, paradigm with traditional stimulation. Um, they've had three trials now. The last one done here is the pivotal study in America. It's uh, multi-center, 10 centers. Um, and uh, actually our First Hill Pain Center was one of the centers here. 
um, they randomized 200 patients almost to either getting traditional spinal cord stimulation, which we call tonic stimulation, or to ultra high frequency, 10,000 hertz stimulation, um, and basically looked at the outcomes at three, six, and 12 months. And um, what I'd like to show here is that um, basically, if you look at the primary endpoint, which was back pain uh, responder rate, so people that had 50% or better improvement in their back pain, we had a very good responder rate uh, in the uh, nevro group or the high frequency stimulation, uh, but we actually also had a very good responder rate in the traditional stimulation group as well. Um, I'm, the, this is not a perfect study. It's not a blinded study, unfortunately. Spinal cord stimulation is hard to do a blinded study in because traditional stimulation, people feel the paresthesia so that they know whether or not they're getting a traditional stimulation. The, this ultra high frequency is people actually can't feel it. Um, so personally, I think they should have done a study where they basically had it on or off and they wouldn't have known whether it was on or off, but they wanted to compare it to traditional spinal cord stimulation so that they um, uh, really just had to only show they were as good. Um, so I do think that there is a kind of a placebo and a study effect. This was sponsored by the company. I think the more important thing is to, to note that um, all spinal cord stimulation is doing a pretty good job at controlling back pain today compared to uh, 10 years ago. So if we look at back pain uh, and leg pain, we see that at 12 months out, we have a 51% and 78% responder rate, and similar uh, for leg pain as well. Um, also, if you uh, look at this, it is uh, sustained for at least 12 months out after, uh, during the study. We don't have a uh, two-year outcome to compare to the process study, um, but I do think that uh, we will be likely to show that it's uh, significant. Um, same thing for leg pain here. Uh, if we look at uh, disability, uh, we see that um, compared to the baseline, both the traditional spinal cord stimulation and the high frequency stimulation show um, basically almost 50% or 60% moderate or minimal disability uh, at 12 months uh, during this study. So uh, that's, that's sort of the newest company. Uh, out on the block, but uh, St. Jude has been around for a while, but they've come out with a new form of spinal cord stimulation that they call burst stimulation. Um, if you look at traditional stimulation, it's, it's basically you know a tonic uh, one pulse, usually about 200 microseconds that comes at a frequency anywhere between 40 and, or, and 100. Um, you can vary it up to 1,200 with most of the companies. Um, but this burst stimulation, they hypothesize is more physiologic, some of the thalamic cells uh, in the brain uh, operate in kind of a bursting manner where basically you have five uh, stimulation uh, pulses very quickly uh, and then it, uh, that comes every, uh, basically in a 40 hertz pattern. So you have kind of a slow stimulation with a much faster stimulation built on top of that and that's thought to be hypothesized to be more uh, physiologic. They, they have uh, basically one study that, that uh, argues that by doing this form of stimulation, you're uh, accessing both the nociceptive pathways of pain control as well uh, as the affective pathways of pain control. So um, uh, hypothesizing that you're more ac likely to stimulate the uh, insular cortex um, and the cingulate <coughs> cortex. The, the data for it, I would say, is not very strong. They, they have a 3D source-localized EEG that shows a little bit greater activity in what's called the dors dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, with their stimulation uh, as opposed to traditional stimulation. But um, I would say the science is not completely there yet that we are, in fact, um, accessing a totally new mode of, of uh, pain control. But uh, if you look at their study uh, that was done uh, by Dr. DeRitter, European study with 15 patients definitely found that burst um, at, uh, was better than tonic stimulation for um, general pain and uh, back pain, uh, not necessarily for limb pain. So that's, that is approved, uh, though it just approved in the United States to be able to use uh, as well. Um, so that's kind of the updated technology. I just wanted to kind of go through one patient that uh, uh, I think most people here would kind of 
have some familiarity with. This is a 59-year-old female that we just did surgery on on Monday. She had a motor vehicle accident in 2002, had uh, bilateral lower extremity uh, and some back pain, but mostly lower extremity pain. She underwent a fusion in 2012 at L5-S1. Uh, she then uh, had an extension of that fusion uh, the next year uh, up to L4-5 as well, but continued to have both back pain and actually worsened uh, uh, radicular pain in the S1 territory, uh, right greater than left. She tried basically everything uh, from a conservative uh, methodology, many medications, physical therapy injections, uh, uh, psychological counseling, chiropractor, TENS, everything. Uh, she underwent a trial of spinal cord simulation with Dr. David, uh, my partner in this whole uh, process here, and had a about an 80% reduction in her uh, pain during the trial. Uh, she had improvements in her daily activities of daily living, uh, her sleep, and had uh, less uh, PRN medications used. Um, here's her, her sort of preoperative imaging for her stimulation. You can see that uh, with her uh, first fusion, it looks like maybe one of the screws went a little medial. Uh, this is the S1 nerve root here. Uh, they redid that during her second fusion. Uh, there's also kind of an abnormal uh, pouching of contrast material here. Um, you can see why it was thought that she had basically scarring arachnoiditis uh, as a cause of her ongoing S1 radiculopathy. Um, when we saw her, we also identified that she really looks like she has a non-union of this 4-5 uh, level. You can see lucency around the screws here. Um, and we brought this up with her. Uh, she was stable on flexion extension x-rays and thought to have a basically a chronic non-union there. Um, and uh, she was so happy with the trial that she wanted to uh, proceed with the, the final uh, implantation. This is the trial electrodes placed by Dr. David. And um, then um, for all of our patients that we go to place a spinal cord stimulator and we always get thoracic imaging because we place these paddle leads in the thoracic spine, and um, I, I have uh, defended a few surgeons who have um, had misadventures placing paddle leads where they did not get this um, and ended up causing um, compression of the spinal cord while, while trying to place a paddle lead. So very important that they always have imaging prior to surgery. Uh, and so this patient then had a uh, paddle lead placed and uh, was doing very well. Uh, on day of surgery, don't have any follow-up yet uh, on her symptom control. But um, again, I'm, I'm much more likely still to use spinal cord simulation for leg pain than back pain, but I do think we are doing a much better job at treating both back pain and leg pain than we have been in the past. And this is just a final slide, just to confuse everybody and show that there is a lot of technology out there. There's a lot of different pluses and minuses to all the different technology out there but you have lots of choices available to you uh, to try to mix and match your needs to the, uh, the patient's needs to the technology that we have available. So thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>